We, you know, it's interesting. We were just in this room a couple of years ago celebrating Ron's 80th birthday party. Uh, had a band that day, and it was uh, it, w- it was a great day, and it was uh, it's nice to see a lot of you again uh, down here in Lake Jackson, and not necessarily in Houston. Uh, Pat Barnett tells me this morning that we have about 340 people here representing. I thought this was impressive. We have 25 states here today, so we're actually about half of the of the United States is represented, along with uh, Australia, uh, Israel, and Canada as well. So, thanks so much for all of you to all of you for making time. Uh, to join us this morning. Really honored by your presence, and I know Ron and Carol appreciate it very much, and uh, we're, we're so happy and honored and pleased that Congressman Massey and David Stockman could make time to be with us this morning. And of course, uh, when we first planned this event last fall, I guess it, it was predictable, perhaps, that, that uh, come April of next year, you know, the United States government would be bombing Syria. But what was perhaps not so predictable was that it would be Donald Trump doing it, because we thought at that point Hillary was going to win. And of course, now we're uh, at the 100th anniversary of Woodrow Wilson signing the declaration of war for the United States to enter World War I. Uh, So we tend to recall that, but what we tend to forget is that it was only a year and a half later that the United States and the Allies signed the armistice. So this wars used to have an end to them, which I think is an interesting concept and, and something we certainly lost. So watching TV yesterday, I always have a, a I always <clears throat> cringe when I hear the term foreign policy establishment or foreign policy community, because you know whoever's going to be the next guest is going to be somebody bad when you hear that. So I'm watching MSNBC Morning Joe and Mika is smiling. She's the happiest she's been since Trump was elected. She's just ecstatic that the United States government is finally doing things, is doing robust things. And, and, you know, when you hear about the foreign policy community, what that really means is they're going to trot out a guest you've seen many, many times before. So they've learned nothing from the Trump election. It's the same old people, the same old ideas, the same old thoughts. So they brought out General Barry McCaffrey, and McCaffrey starts, his, starts waxing eloquent about the virtues of these Tomahawk missiles. You know, you can park a, a warship in international waters and send these missiles for hundreds, maybe thousands of miles, and they can hit a target the size of a garage door, et cetera, et cetera. So he's animated by this. And then he continues, but, you know, our next task, the next step in this is taking out the Syrian Air Force. And this, unlike just lobbing Tomahawk missiles, is actually going to require air power launched in other words, fighter planes launched from, from U.S. naval vessels. So he goes on and on about how this is the next step. And it was incredible to me to listen to this, how, the, how these things just devolve, how, how, how one airstrike uh, then leads to taking out the Syrian uh, air force. There's no plan for any of this. There's no declaration of war. It's just something that, that sort of unrolls. And it seems so natural to McCaffrey that this should happen. And I think it has become natural for us. And when we think about foreign policy in the United States, we think about foreign policy intelligentsia, the so-called think tanks. For, for the most part, I don't think it's a stretch to say they've been captured. They've been captured by people with neoconservative foreign policy views, empire building, nation building views, imperialist views. And they've also been captured by the defense industry. That may sound like a bit of a cl- cliche, but I think it's largely true. And that's why we're, we're, you know, we're so pleased to, to partner today with the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, because really, from my perspective, they're the only organization in the United States, certainly, that's devoted to foreign policy from a purely non-interventionist perspective. In other words, from the perspective that non-interventionism ought to be an actual principle by which we conduct foreign policy, rather than just a policy option. And by non-interventionism, I mean that absent a really compelling threat to the United States, that our country, our government, should not interfere militarily, clandestinely, economically in the affairs of other countries. It's really just that simple. And this is the case, of course, that Ron Paul made for years and years in Congress. Uh, It's not isolationism. It's certainly not pacifism, although it's oftentimes painted that way. But of course, non-interventionism as a theory is based on the idea, the ancient idea of just war doctrine, that there ought to be some real interest served by going to war other than just a self-serving national interest. 
And I think we've reached the point now where the national interest of the United States can mean virtually anything. I mean, should you, if, if a country is, is potentially going to have nuclear weapons 20 years hence or 30 years hence, is that a sufficient national interest for us to be engaging them militarily today? I think there's some people who would say yes to that question. But the Ron Paul Institute is, is really dedicated to the opposite perspective, that we should never interfere in the affairs of another country, absent a real justification. And of course, the Mises Institute, really since its inception with Lou Rockwell, has always been anti-war and, and pro-non-intervention. It's, it's really been part of our, our, our uh, hallmark as an organization. Because I think if you understand economics, you very quickly understand that, that any country or government big enough to have an empire abroad is, is big enough to be burdensome and, and onerous at home, tyrannical at home even. I think the Mises Institute has always tried to make the case uh, that there's a connection between central banks and war. There's a connection between the Fed and war finance. And of course, our namesake, Ludwig von Mises himself, fought as a lieutenant in World War I in the Austro-Hungarian army. He was actually the ripe old age of 32 when he entered that war, quite a bit older than many of his uh, fellow soldiers, and had already written a major treatise on money. He was already a very accomplished thinker, uh, a le legal expert, and an economist. And during that war, he writes in his memoirs that during some of his darkest moments in that war, he committed himself to writing another book afterwards about socialism because he really viewed war as a socialist enterprise and hence a nonsensical enterprise. And he gave, gives a very interesting quote in his memoirs about uh, war intelligentsia, the same people who plague us today. And I'm quoting Mises, he says, speaking of the Great War, World War I, the war came as a result of an ideology that had been proclaimed from German lecterns for hundreds of years. Professors of economics had contributed to the intellectual preparation for war. Sounds familiar. They did not first need to be retrained in order to become the intellectual bodyguards of the Hohenzollern. And here he's referring to the House of Hohenzollern, the, the German, Prussian, Romanian dynasty. He says, economics was no longer taught. What was taught were the doctrines of war. And I think that rings so true today. I guess we don't have monarchical dynasties anymore. I don't know what our houses are today. We have the, today we have the, the, the House of Crystal or the House of Northrop Grumman. Or the, those are the only seeming dynasties in America anymore that just that come and go regardless of administrations. And of course, it was, it was largely because of Ludwig von Mises that Ron Paul became Ron Paul. I'm sure a lot of you in this room know the story of Ron going to see Mises in the early 1970s at the University of Houston. And Ron came back from that talk uh, really dedicated to the idea that he had to do something. He was a very happy and prosperous doctor at the time, but he felt that he wasn't doing enough, that he had to take the ideas that Mises was talking about and do something with them in his personal life. And of course, that led to him running for Congress, where, uh, and I think he will tell you that he, he really started off as more of an economic libertarian. And if he had just been willing to stay that way, if he had just been willing to sort of tamp down some of his beliefs in the foreign policy arena, he really could have been a darling of the conservative libertarian establishment. He could have been feted in Washington. He could have been made quite wealthy, uh, received donations, but he would never do it. You know, he, and, he, and he showed his, his non-interventionist uh, credentials early on. E even when President Reagan called him and asked for his support for the B-1 bomber program, and here's Ron, a young congressman who had been one of the few Republicans to support Reagan's nomination in 76, one of only three or four Republicans at that time in the Texas delegation. He took that call from Reagan in his office. He said, no, I can't do it. And Ron continued to show uh, his non-interventionist credentials when he signed his tremendous resignation letter to the RNC in 1987 and said, I can't be a Republican any longer. And he showed it when he ran for president in 1988, the Libertarian Party platform where he insisted on having foreign policy as a key part of his campaign message. Uh, he certainly showed it on October 10th, 2002, when he used one of only six Republicans to vote against the Iraq War authorization. He showed it in 2008, uh, in his now infamous Giuliani moment uh, in the debates on, uh, I guess that was Fox News. Uh, and he certainly showed it in 2012 
when, as, as Carol Paul mentioned this last night, he was in South Carolina at a Republican uh, primary debate and brought up the golden rule as a model for how Congress ought to conduct foreign policy and was resoundingly booed by the GOP primary voters in attendance. And of course, he showed it uh, really continuously since leaving Congress, uh, deciding to create the Ron Paul Institute and to go on uh, all the major media talking head shows and have the, uh, the audacity to question things like the uh, Syrian gas attack a couple of days ago. And I think Ron deserves a lot of credit for really putting neoconservatism on its heels somewhat and, and playing a role in that sense uh, in the revolution we've had, the anti-war revolution we've had in just the past couple of years. Because there's a, an old adage in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. And the neoconservatives have always had us explaining. And now it's time to turn the tables on them. Let, let's have them explain for a while why it's our job to remake the Middle East into uh, Jeffersonian democracies, why it's our job to police the world, why it's our job to spend trillions of dollars on defense systems. Uh, and I think for the first time in a long time, the neoconservatives are forced to explain themselves. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So I'll leave you with this before we introduce our guest this morning. You know, way before I ever heard of Ron Paul as a young guy, uh, for whatever reason, in, in our house, there was a copy of All Quiet on the Western Front laying around. And I happened to pick this up as a young guy, and I've probably read it 20 times. I read it just over and over again uh, in my youth. And it, it's really one of the greatest anti-war books ever written without trying to be. It's just a very honest uh, and, and uh, assessment of a, of a fictional assessment of a young soldier's uh, life in World War I. But um, I've read it a couple times with my own son, who's now 13. And in this book, of course, we follow uh, Paul Boimer, who's only 19 when he first goes off uh, to join the German army and, you know, full of vigor and, and convinced that, that, uh, that Germany's in the right. And the opening scene in this book, he's with his, his, uh, his buddies, Krupp and Mueller, and they go to see Kimmerich, who's in the hospital, who's been wounded and is doing very badly. And as they're standing around his hospital bed, it becomes quite obvious that Kimmerich is probably not going to survive through the night. And as much as they love him as their, as their, uh, their comrade in arms, uh, they immediately start to eye his, his very shiny and still in good condition boots. And they start to ask themselves, what will happen if we don't come back tonight? Uh, will the orderly take his boots? Who will get his boots? Will they fit me? And so already just a year or so into the war, uh, Paul Boimer's starting to lose some of his humanity. Uh, he, he's, he's forced to think more about his comrade's boots than his comrade's actual death, because this is the, the, the situation in which he's been put. So a lot of this book is really about how Paul Boimer loses his youth and loses his innocence. Uh, and there's a very poignant scene where he comes home for leave, and, and just two years removed from his hometown, he can no longer relate to the townspeople because war has changed him so much. And what's interesting as we see this today, when, when, when our soldiers come, when soldiers come back from, from Iraq and Afghanistan, we try to relate to them. Uh, his townspeople are still clueless about the war. They're still saying, well, you're just seeing the skirmishes you're in. You can't see the big picture. And, you know, uh, and then all, you know, we'll be on to Paris soon. And of course, Germany at this point is badly losing. So uh, I really recommend this book to just understand the sheer meaningless and the senselessness of, of war. I think it's, it, it stands even today as one of the great anti-war books. And I'd like to just read you a quick passage of it that, 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 uh, that I love so much. This is his friend Krop talking, and this is soldier talk <clears throat> when they're not at the front lines. He says, it's queer when one thinks about it, goes on Krop. We're here to protect our fatherland. And the French are over there to protect their fatherland. Now, who's in the right? Well, perhaps both, I say, without believing it. Yes, well now, pursues Albert, I see that he means to drive me in a corner. But our professors and parsons and newspapers say that we are the only ones that are right. And let's hope so. But the French professors and parsons and newspapers say the right is on their side. Now, what about that? Well, that I don't know, I say. But whichever way is, there's a war all the same. And every month, more countries coming in. He says, and then Jaden appears. He says, how does a war get started? Well, mostly by one country badly offending another, answers Albert with a slight air of superiority. Then Jaden pretends to be obtuse. A country 
I don't follow. A mountain in Germany cannot offend a mountain in France, or a river, or a wood, or a field of wheat. So are you really just as stupid as that? Or are you just pulling my leg, grouse crop? I don't mean that at all. One people offends the other. Then I haven't any business here at all, replies Jaden. I don't feel myself offended. So I've always remembered that passage from the book, and I've always enjoyed it so much.